Dear ladies and gentlemen, I am extremely thankful to be able to speak here today and support gender equality, an important topic that I truly believe in from the bottom of my heart. We have seen all over the world when women are given freedom, the ability and the respect to pursue their dreams and ambitions, the world becomes better for everybody. We have seen that gender equality increases innovation, creativity, performance, and eventually profitability. But we also must be honest and realize that today we still don't have equal opportunities for everyone. So we must take action. We must challenge the status quo. We must break the bias. There is where the UN target gender equality program fits in and where we at Hensold are very proud to be part of. This program is a great opportunity for companies to empower women, and I can only highly recommend it. It basically provides a step-by-step -step guidance on how to increase gender equality and how to put your ideas into practice. Of course, our targets, action plans, and policies are very important, but what matters the most is our mindset. We must be willing and committed to make a difference. So what do we do at Hensold? At Hensold, we are committed to provide equal opportunities. We believe that a culture of diversity and inclusion must be the new normal in today's world. We will have achieved our goal when we don't have to talk about it anymore. Hensold accepts the challenge. We decided to make diversity and inclusion a priority in our company. One of our major goals is to promote women in leadership. Therefore, we set ourselves ambitious targets. We want to increase women in leadership to 25% by 2024, 30% to 2026, and in the executive committee, 35% by 2024. A crucial role hereby plays an initiative that we launch called Elevate. I'm very proud of this initiative. Within the aerospace and defense industry, we face a significant gender inequity, specifically in the field of STEM and leadership. For this reason, it is Elevate's mission to not only establish an inclusive culture, but to act as a think tank to increase gender balance. Elevate offers a community for all employees to share their experiences, speak up, and engage for a more diverse future. As a part of Elevate, we recently rolled out a training series on unconscious biases. As I said before, it starts with the mindset, and I believe it is essential that we become aware of potential biases. Only then we can break them. There is still a long path ahead of us, but most important is that we took the first steps and that we will never give up. We will keep going and we will tackle this together. Let's stand up for equality and female empowerment. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for the introduction. Distinguished panelists, guests, and all of you joining us for this event, very welcome. And I'm delighted to be moderating this discussion, which is focused on regional private sector activities, advancing gender equality and women's empowerment, particularly in Eastern Europe. And many thanks to UN Global Compact for convening this important discussion. As we're all acutely aware, crises have far-reaching impact within and beyond the region, whether we're talking about the pandemic, climate change, or war. Women and girls are the ones who usually pay the highest price because of the existing gender gaps, if you will, the pre-existing underlying conditions that increase their vulnerability. And also, in times of crisis, work on gender equality gets put on the back burner. So now, more than ever, we need all hands on deck for advancing gender equality and women's empowerment. We need private sector partners to continue and scale up their efforts. The UN Women Regional Office for Europe and Central Asia is a proud partner of UN Global Compact, 
And together we're working hand in hand with private sector so that they can adopt and even more importantly, implement the women's empowerment principles. What you'll hear us referring to as the WEPs throughout our conversation today. Since its launch, the gender gap analysis tool has gone hand in hand with the work on the webs. The data from this tool helps companies to understand key gaps, and it also helps them to and informs the policies and practices that they need to put in place to address those gaps. When we look at the 2021 aggregate data, the tool reveals that important gaps persist in all areas for this region. For example, in Eastern Europe, we only have 106 companies who are using this tool. And a quarter of those are financial institutions. And even with the small number, barely a third of these companies have established a clear gender strategy that is supported by their leadership. We see that 38% are committed to establish policies and practices for a more gender equal workplace but only 14% have responsible marketing policies or gender sensitive procurement policies in place. And only 16 have corporate social responsibility policies that focus on the communities where they operate. These numbers are food for thought for our discussion today. And we hope that together with our esteemed panelists, we can go and dig a little bit deeper to get their insights on some of the aspects and the challenges and the opportunities that are out there. We have three speakers from this region, and today we will hear from them, their experiences in using the WEPS tool, and also their efforts in, in promoting the women's empowerment principles and applying the principles in their day-to-day -day work. I'd like to address the first question to the panelists. When you initially used the women's empowerment principles and the WEPS tool, what have been some of the immediate issues that your company has had to address? And how was the implementation of the WEPs and this tool beneficial for your company? I am going to turn to our first speaker, Emily Clausen, who is Senior Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Consultant at Velux Denmark. Emily is responsible for developing and implementing Velux's global diversity and inclusion agenda. It's very impressive to say Emily has facilitated multiple competency-based diversity and inclusion workshops in over 35 countries worldwide and brings a great deal of experience with her. Welcome, Emily. And given your longstanding knowledge in this area of work, we would be really interested to hear your personal experience and the results of the WEPS tool in Velux. What were some of the first actions? And also, we want more companies from this region. We, can, we want to get more than the 106 that we have currently using this tool. So what messages do you have for them? Emily, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much. And I'm really happy to be here um, speaking about uh, our work at Velux. And I will share that we were part of the Target Gender Equality Program through the UN Global Compact um, this last year in 2021. And so uh, we are relatively uh, new to the tool in that the first time we've been using it was this last fall. And already it's been uh, really helpful for us uh, in our work. And so I'll share that when we first looked at the WEPS tool, uh, the first challenge was that we didn't have a clear global baseline for the 18 different categories in the tool. Um, we are a company with 27 production sites in 11 different countries, and then we have sales companies in 40 countries. And so um, in terms of answering, you know, what does parental leave look like? What do different um, things look like in different countries? We always know that we're in compliance with local legislation and with each uh, within each local market, we're competitive in terms of what we offer. But um, historically, we haven't had that global set of expectations, and this is what we're aiming for. And so, um, part of what we're actually planning to use the webs to do is to help us create that uh, guideline and those expectations that even though we have different legal 
uh, market and cultural contexts at our different locations around the world, that it does make sense that we have some things that we're aiming for and that we have a baseline of what we're hoping to do when it comes to um, equity with women. And so uh, we're actually planning, this is pretty exciting. Um, we are hoping our goal is to become a leader uh, in terms of how the WEPS assesses pe people from beginning uh, beginner, improver, achiever, leader. We're hoping to become a leader as assessed by the tool by 2025, by the end of 2025. And so that's a really exciting um, journey for us. It's really working as a roadmap for us to be able to start uh, working towards moving the needle. So we're really excited about it. Um, even though we're pretty new in terms of using the WEPs in our journey, uh, we're excited to get started. Thank you so much, Emily. And I think you have really underscored the importance of data and that being the, the basis on which you can make your policies and measure progress and hold yourself to account. So fantastic points raised there. Um, our second panelist is Milica Popovic from Arup, Serbia. Milica is the team leader and key social consultant responsible for impact assessment of large infrastructure projects on local communities. She's also the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Champion for Arup Serbia. Arup is a professional services multinational with very notable corporate social responsibility activities and several initiatives to combat climate change, a topic that is at the top of the global agenda. Welcome, Melitza. Thank you very much for joining our panel today. And we'd love to hear from you how Arup has used the tool or plans to use the tool. How has been the reaction and the response to any of the preliminary results? So if you want to reflect on some of the ideas in terms of getting that baseline, baseline um, that Emily talked about. And also if you uh, have faced or foresee any challenges in using the tool. So over to you, Melitza. So hi everyone. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you for that. And, and I appreci appreciate uh, particularly what Emily said because similarly we are relatively new in uh, using the web tool. Um, Arup has for a while, long while been considering this this issue because we're an engineering company uh, to begin with. So traditionally. Uh, the leadership has been male. We have a joke in, in Ireland, especially uh, in, our, in our group in Ireland, it's a bunch of old white men, uh, but it, it really does look like that. Uh, I have to say in Arab Serbia, it's, it's drastically different because it's a, a relatively young team. And um, what we do is environmental and social consultancy, which tends to, uh, attract more women generally. And this is something that, that we've, we've, been, we've identified as a, a, let's say, potential for more women in leadership in our globally uh, is actually focusing on some of the consultancy work because we, during the, the baseline, we've noticed, uh, during developing the baseline, we've noticed that uh, women in leadership roles in Europe tend to have roles in uh, sustainability, in climate change uh, actions, in uh, uh, social responsibility, community engagement. So I would call them softer uh, uh, elements of the engineering practice, while the hardcore engineering uh, still mostly resides with, with men. Um, and in that sense, our baseline is pretty much skewed, depending on what team you're looking at, uh, you know, what, what uh, services the team is providing. Uh, in the design, I have to say, unfortunately, it's still pretty much male dominated. Uh, and, I, and I don't understand this why, because I'm, I'm a structural engineer, I'm a civil engineer, and I remember this very, very vividly from university, that the number of women uh, in my year was actually the same as, as men. Uh, so the you know it's it was always baffling for me how many women tend to change their career direction from the hardcore engineering into some of the softer elements of the engineering uh, sector. 
Thank you so much, Melitza. I think uh, if we're talking about gaps and opportunities, then we can see it both in a negative and a positive light. You know, there is a big gap, but there are huge opportunities there. And hopefully the political will um, that you have uh, generated in the company will help you achieve great results. So we'll be following closely and seeing how that comes, gets done. And we'll have the opportunity to speak with you again, in particular, in terms of uh, concrete activities you're planning to undertake. But mm -hmm. now it's my pleasure to turn to our third panelist. Blazenka Tsitsko Anic joins us from Croatia. She is the Research and Development Director of Saponia, which is a chemicals and cosmetics manufacturer. And in her position, she is dedicated to the principles of sustainable design and manufacturing, as well as being a gender equality champion. Blazenka is involved in a different number of projects that tackle waste management, plastic recycling, bio-based chemicals, and very much um, promoting the principles of the circular economy. So we have um, a lot to hear from you about many topics here, Blajanka. Welcome, and thank you for joining us in this panel. Um, and please share with us how you are implementing the Women's Empowerment Principles, the WEPs, and how you are using or plan on using the tool. Has it helped? Any challenges you see? Any plans for the future? Over to you, Plajanka. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very proud to be here and to have the opportunity to share with you our experience. Uh, well, in Saponia, uh, we are quite fresh in web, uh, but the gender equality is long lived within our company. Uh, for instance, uh, we have now at the moment 42% uh, of female employees, but 52% of uh, our management positions are kept uh, uh, by women. Uh, also the president of the board is uh, some 10 years ago, we had in total 52% of our employees, uh, but with uh, changes in technology and the fact that now technical expertise is required at more positions, uh, we have a problem with filling those positions. Uh, uh, just like Melitza also said, uh, because women, they uh, not so often uh, attend electronics and mechanics school. And if they do that, <laughs> they also maybe change their career after. Uh, uh, quite the opposite is when it comes to expert positions uh, and university education, almost all of our researchers uh, are women. Uh, we have more female experts in almost all fields except mechanics. Although in that we have also, let's say 40%, but uh, not so much. Uh, what we want to tackle uh, long-term is encourage girls to attend technical schools and uh, STEM education, uh, not only at university, but also high school level. And uh, we have also collaboration with uh, high schools, with universities in Croatia. So just to, to encourage, uh, encourage them. Uh, compared to other companies, I think uh, that we, uh, we have rather balanced team, uh, but we are aware that having uh, a balanced team isn't just about the numbers, but also about fostering a uh, balance between private and work life and then achieving corporate culture where expertise is accounted for for it's most important, not the gender. So, and in, in our everyday life and work, for instance, uh, I am in R&B and I have uh, many uh, young uh, colleagues, uh, mothers with small children. And uh, I think I try uh, every day to, uh, to, to make them life easier. You know, if they cannot be, we, we can just uh, uh, replay something or just to adjust some of our uh, obligations according to them. And I, I think it's the most important thing to, uh, to uh, just for them uh, to stay with us. Thank you so much, Plezhenka. I think you've echoed some of the points raised earlier in terms of 
the fact that you know these underlying pre-existing structural barriers to gender equality and women's empowerment manifest themselves in the corporate world and uh, complicate the efforts that you know corporates are trying to make to support women's advancement in respective companies. So this is, I think, a very valid point that all of you have have sort of underscored. Um, we hope that you will be able to use the tool. It's great that you're engaging with the tool. Of course, it is voluntary and it is meant to help the learning of the companies. And as we've heard from Emily, set that baseline on, and set those targets and benchmarks. With, and we hope everybody would be as uh, aspirational as we've heard from Velux in, in really setting those high standards. And I just want to say that we really want to encourage companies out there, uh, including yourselves, to share the results moving forward, also with shareholders, so that there can be this um, mutual and shared accountability for ensuring progress. We know from the data that has been gathered through this tool that only 34% of companies in the region are taking proactive measures to recruit women in those traditionally underrepresented roles. This means that there needs to be more that is done and that is gender sensitive and gender responsive. Countless studies have shown us and have proven that women are key actually for corporate success in terms of overall performance and profitability. And so with this in mind and with all base, building on all these inputs that you've already given us, your thoughts on those proactive measures you're already putting in place or that you would want to advocate for or are planning to reduce those gaps and where we can make sure that we're both addressing those um, structural issues at entry you know what we've heard in terms of um, the, num the, the women are not applying for those posts, but how can you address that issue, but also work with a pipeline of women leaders uh, in the corporates and across the value chains, across the industries and also the roles they hold. hold. So um, Emily, I'll turn back to you for your thoughts. I'll be very interested to hear from you. Great, thank you so much. And it's great to uh, hear from the other panelists as well. And um, so I'll start by sharing, I think in terms of how the WEPS is really helping us in, in some specific ways in our organizational culture. And sorry, I think I, with, with the question, um, there was a few different parts of it, but in terms of just, I can talk about some of the proactive measures and how the WEPS is, is helping us. Is there anything I missed in my summary there of the question? Okay, <laughs> great. Um, so one thing um, just as a uh, to share in terms of context on how we are using it is, um, and you had shared my title, which is um, doing diversity, equity, and inclusion at Thelux. And so one thing that's really great um, in terms of how we're using the WEPs is making sure that we're not just focusing on diversity in terms of representation of women in leadership, just like you were just saying, um, but we're also focusing on having an equitable and inclusive environment for everyone. So of course, it's not just, you know, recruiting women and hiring women, but making sure that we can bring our voices to the table, that we're not having, you know, turnover because it's not a place where we can succeed or access opportunities. And so um, using uh, the WEPS tool to really help us make sure we are building that environment where it, there are equitable opportunities and we can remove some of those barriers has been really important. Um, and part of that is because in addition to our work with the WEPS, we do have a pretty ambitious target in our sustainability strategy. So we have at Velux a, a 2030 sustainability strategy in which our one of our key targets around diversity, equity, and inclusion is to increase women in management positions. And we want 40% um, of senior management positions uh, to be held by women and 45% of all management positions held by women. And even though I know that's not exactly um, representative of the world of women, um, like my the other panelists were saying, um, currently in our uh, in our sector, uh, we are a window manufacturing uh, 
you know, uh, company. And so we also have a lot of uh, STEM roles and in the construction industry, we're uh, pretty underrepresented at this point um, in terms of women across the board and particularly in leadership. And so that goal, those goals are actually pretty ambitious for us. And so it was really important that we're not just going to aim for the goals of, you know, having women, you know, in roles, but we also want to make sure that these women can succeed. And so that's one of the key uses of the WEPS that we're really excited that we're going to pair it, these two goals together to make sure we're really doing um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and so I can also share, um, so that's just kind of the, the context of it. Um, and, and then in terms of other proactive practices, I can say we are um, really starting to gather our data at different levels. Um, and that's one thing that the, the Target Gender Equality Program really helped us with um, in terms of identifying what are the workforce metrics that we can be tracking and be moving, um, setting targets on. So that's really exciting. And then another proactive um, step I just want to mention is making sure that when we're talking about women, uh, that we're not excluding women um, of any identity, so that we're thinking of all women, so women of all ages, um, women with disabilities, women with different you know, races and ethnicities. And um, that's another piece of um, that's really important to our work here. So that's another proactive way where we'll be able to, to reach more um, women. Thank you so much, Emily. Super important points. Yes, the women are not a homogeneous group. Um, we need to think about intersecting forms of um, discrimination and challenges that women, different women face in different contexts. So very valid point. Thank you so much. And I will turn now to Milica. You already spoke to us. Uh, about the challenges that are faced uh, in a company that uh, does have sort of engineering as a foundational stone. But at the same time, we know that uh, infrastructure development projects are so transformational and they remain, women remain um, underrepresented there. But many of the industries today are facing growing pressure to innovate and become even more transformative, remain competitive in a global economy and failing to address gender diversity holds them back. So we would be really interested to hear more from you about the, measure that are, the measures that are planned in Arup to create this pipeline of women executives like yourselves. You're there, what more can be done to get more like you into Arup and in other companies? Over to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, actually, it's a, it's a really good point. So uh, I, I am quite often used as an example of somebody who overcame <laughs> uh, the fact that she's a woman in engineering uh, uh, because I fought into uh, a leadership role. Uh, but what I think is, is most important is actually, you know, having that uh, transferred on. Uh, so uh, Emily uh, made a very good point about it's not just about putting women in leadership roles, it's, it's making sure that they can perform well in those leadership roles. So providing them proper training, but also providing them proper confidence, because there's a, a, a few stereotypes about what it means to be a leader. And we typically assign male traits when we talk about leaders. Um, and Alia, I think you, you mentioned this all, already, uh, it, the st statistics have shown that women in leadership roles greatly contribute to the uh, success of the company because the compassion, the support, the, well, I, I want to say multitasking, but I've been told that that's not specifically a female trait, but anyway. So, but uh, there are female traits that are very important in leaders that we know now, but may not uh, be it may not be a common um, feeling among people, and I don't mean just men. I particularly mean women. And what we've been working on internally is building up this confidence that women should go for for leadership roles, even though they're not aggressive or assertive, or even though they have families and might have limited time to to work. Um, that those are not the reasons why somebody shouldn't go for a leadership role. Um, and this is uh, 
the the uh, in, in, over the last couple of years this has been a, a really big push within our company especially in the europe region uh to establish this network of women who have succeeded but can prove to other women that you don't have to compromise yourself or your capabilities or change to fit into into a mall in order to, to become a successful leader. Thank you so much, Melitza. I think you've covered some really important points. I think echoing some of Emily's in terms of, yes, we need to look at um, the overall environment, but also focusing very much on women as agents of change, and um, that they can have agency and can take on that leadership role, and that the company needs to be in that supportive role um, moving forward and looking at their particular needs. I think that's a point very well taken. Um, and I will uh, now turn to Blajenka to also learn about Saponia's initiatives to leverage women as agents of change within the company. So how um, are you working on increasing women's representation in senior leadership? Or what paths do you see towards this kind of vision in the future? Over to you, Blajenka. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, we uh, we do our best and try, and uh, some of us are really here uh, to prove that, like Melissa said, uh, just to prove other girls and young women that uh, really it's possible to to have a family and to be successful at work. And uh, sometimes uh, we don't have uh, enough female candidates, and I think that's the uh, a main problem at the moment, uh, as I already uh, mentioned in my previous uh, answer, uh, but we uh, we have a contact and cooperation uh, cont contracts with local schools as a, and universities in order to secure a pipeline of ca female candidates. Uh, 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 but uh, uh, when there is no interest to enter those educational programs, uh, companies don't have suitable candidates and they actually cannot fill some positions uh, with desired candidates. But I think in Croatia is a good campaign which started with our uh, president. Uh, we had uh, actually a female president of the Republic of Croatia a few years ago, and she started uh, just, uh, just encouraging uh, women to start career in STEM. And so uh, also our government does a lot just to, to encourage also uh, young people, but also uh, young girls uh, to, to, to start their career in STEM. And so we hope we will uh, have not, uh, not uh, so much problems in the future with our candidates. Uh, and also, um, if there was more research on connection between company success and gender equality, in a way that hard data is presented underlying the premise that it is good for corporate bottom uh, line to, to have more women, equal pay, etc. I think it's also one way to, to encourage women to end. Uh, I think our everyday, uh, everyday effort to support our young colleagues, uh, co uh, colleagues at work, I think it's, uh, it's the best uh, what we can do at the moment. Uh, in you know everyday business thank you thank you so much i think uh, both you blazenka and melita were talking about the importance of role models those who are sort of paving the way and how important it is to learn from them and use them as inspiration but also focusing on a younger generation so really coming at this from those younger generation of women who are coming into the company and how they can be supported by other women, but as well as by um, the, the corporate more broadly through its policies. And I think you've talked a lot about also this kind of data and evidence being a foundation for that advocacy that you need to do. And I think this is what we are here 
um, about. You know, we hope that today's session is part of building that business case in our region for corporates to do more on gender equality and to leverage the women's empowerment principles. We feel the dedication and the passion that you all of you bring to the discussion today. Um, and it's very timely because this is being held on the occasion of International Women's Day in 2022. And the focus, of course, is on gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. And it's very much looking at gender equality in the context of climate change, environmental degradation, and disaster risk reduction, which really threaten any gains that we have um, in terms of our progress towards the sustainable development goals, which should be just around the corner, the deadline is 2030. We know women are more affected. We know even though they are more affected, they are underrepresented. So I now turn to each of you to have a reflection. Climate change is an existential crisis. We, this year, as in the previous two years, have faced multiple crises where women and girls have borne the brunt. And I would want you to, to tell us what would be your call to action for other companies? What is it that companies can do to influence and support women's leadership in solving global crisis? Emily, I know I haven't given you a lot of time to reflect on this, but if you can tell us in one or two sentences, what would be your call to action? Over to you, Emily. Well, I am. I think it's important for companies to really recognize that um, for the you know sustainability and just the continuing of our planet as a whole um, that we really need to invest um, in our people and our planet in a way uh, that's sustainable and that's healthy for communities for all people you know women families men everyone um, non-binary people as well it's really um, and and I guess with that part of that is that our our customers and our, our employers are expecting that more and more. And so I guess this goes to the business case because in terms of a call to action, I think the more companies realize that we aren't going to meet, um, like Lajenka was saying, we're not going to meet our bottom lines. We're not going to grow as a business. We're not going to continue to exist unless we are um, adjusting how we do things in order to uh, be a, a reputable business in the eyes of our customers um, and our employees. And so I think um, just really understanding that that expectation is growing and it's been growing and it will continue to grow. Um, sorry, that wasn't very succinct, but I think it is hopefully <laughs> something that will um, give a little um, encouragement for companies to really to really work on this. Thank you very much, Emily. Melitza, we turn to you. What is your call to action? Yeah, I, I don't think I'm going to be succinct any, uh, either. Uh, but uh, from, from my perspective, it, because we we are in, here, especially in Serbia, involved in infrastructure project, the the climate change and and the impacts uh, on on our projects on uh, sustainable infrastructure on um, the communities that are losing land, losing access to water. These are all uh, issues that we are seeing literally uh, on a daily basis. And uh, from our perspective, what has been the most important element to kind of trying to bridge those gaps and, and, and compensate uh, is actually stakeholder engagement. It is engaging these women, and especially like in rural communities where, the, like you said, the brunt of the, the impact is really on them. They are the ones who are organizing um, uh, the, the households. And, and you can actually see, you know, when when the, the surveys are done, that the male are, males are responding and asking for, I don't know, compensation in terms of an additional football field or something like that. Uh, while they're in, in the same time losing um, uh, uh, access to um, environmental services or e economic ser um, eco services like fishing or, uh, you know, not, not just like uh, from the land itself, but from from the wider eco services. So it's it, it 
the stakeholder engagement has really helped us on, on numerous uh, projects identify what are the specific issues of the communities impacted by these projects um, and to identify the, the best solutions for those communities through, through proper stakeholder engagement. Thank you so much. Uh, Blajanka? Yes, I, I'll try to, to say it in one little sentence because I, I know we are out of uh, time. I think it's a, it's a good thing and uh, we have to connect uh, uh, sustainability and more women uh, on uh, some positions because I think and we all know that women are more sensitive and they really uh, they 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 will they will really try to do all the best to to leave this world uh, better for their children and and for future generations and I think it's very important to to use this power actually that women have and that passion to survive and and to do all the best for future generations. Thank you so much, Emily, Melitza, Blajanka. I mean, for your passion, for your determination, uh, you are role models yourselves for what we expect companies out there to do more of. Your calls to action are well heard. Your insights have been indispensable. We hope that all of you who have been listening to us today are encouraged to find out more on the webs if you don't know about them already. And also for the companies out there to sign up and to use this tool to get into this conversation because there is a sense of urgency. There are different ways of doing things. There is more that each and every one of us can do to build a better world for everyone. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. We do believe, and I again repeat, that the Women's Empowerment Principles are an effective tool for supporting companies to apply gender responsive approaches throughout their value chains in leadership support, non-discrimination, stakeholder engagement, ensuring health and well-being of workers, including what we heard about in terms of understanding the burden of care that many women are facing, having that flexibility in parental leave, also looking at marketing and supply chain practices that can promote equality more sustainably. We hope that in the very near future, working on gender equality and women's empowerment will indeed, as Emily has said, become an integral part of what every private sector company does. And I would like to end with my call for action to invite everyone listening today, all public and private sector partners, all civil society and international partners to work together with the, with with the others in a multi-stakeholder kind of push to jumpstart the change we so badly need. And the women out there that are looking to us to build that better future together with them. Thank you all very much and wishing you all a happy International Women's Day.